we're back on part two of the Dean of Myrtle Beach. Stay tuned. He's coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're in the lobby of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce. We're focused on Brad Dean Part 2. Good morning, Brad. Good morning. Welcome back. It sounds back. a little strange. It, as you made very <laughs> clear yesterday, it's not all about Brad Dean. Uh, it's yeah. all about the entire community here. Absolutely. This is a community organization, and not only do we have 54 staff that help it continue to move forward, we've got a large board of directors, over 300 volunteers, and we serve over 2,300 businesses. So this is not Brad Dean's chamber. It's the community's right. chamber. Right. I'm just fortunate enough to sit at the helm for a little while. Absolutely. You know, it was great walking in early this morning, and you all were kind enough to open it up. Up for us, seeing Doris is it Doris Whiteley, Doris Whitley, Absolutely. who had been the uh, the volunteer of the year a few years ago. I remember when Bre Bob Brooks was there to present her uh, a flight on the Hooters Air and some other folks there. Some of those great prizes, and to see you mentioned those 300 volunteers. She's one of many, but a lot of them have to make it tick. Absolutely, you know Doris. Uh, she is a professional volunteer. By by uh, morning, she works, I believe, the Surfside United Methodist Church. In the afternoon, we get her here, and she's been an instrumental part of the success in the convention. Bureau. But I think Doris is exemplary not only in her service to the chamber but to the community, and yet there are literally, Greg, thousands of Dorises out there you know, in our community who are giving back to so many organizations. You yourself have been very involved in several of those, and you know how important it is to keep the Grand Strand moving, to have oh, yeah. the volunteers not only involved but truly engaged in those organizations and in their community. Right. You know, Larry Bragg was with us here in your lobby on Monday and Tuesday, and to hear him talk about the Community Parents Board, a volunteer a group, nine-member group, and a lot that has to happen as a volunteer of any group, whatever it is. Absolutely, and people like that really made the Grand Strand grow to the way it is. I, I think uh, of the hours and the years that they've spent investing, not just in community organizations they believe in, but the community in general, being there in its time of need. And, of course, Mr. Bragg is just one example of uh, the, the people who have just been so dedicated to this community. And Of course, he's had a, a direct hand in influencing the growth and growth patterns of the area and uh, certainly has played an instrumental role in that. But uh, whether it's Larry Bragg, Doris Whitley, or thousands of others, they've helped the Grand Strand grow to what it's become today. And people like you and I come here afterwards, we can appreciate all that they've done and all the potential the community still has to do. Absolutely. You know, so many aspects you talked about yesterday, we talked about I-73, a lot of the big push there. We sure want to spend a little time today thinking about offshore drilling, which has been a hot topic, about beach renourishment. You highlighted, and we weren't able to quite wrap up, that grant. There was a recent grant that the state, a park recreation and tourism, uh, provided a $5 million matching grant, a two, oh, two to one, I believe, for the $10 million that was raised locally. How did the community get together to raise that? Was it all done by behind the scenes, or had there been a call to let people know about chipping in, and just how were those funds raised? Yeah. It really uh, was a, an effort by uh, a small number of local business leaders who came together and said, we have built so many rooms, we really have to attract more visitors to fill those rooms. And in and of itself, that was the business challenge. But I think the greater challenge, Greg, was they recognized that as the Grand Strand grows and evolves into a very special destination, even beyond what we know it is today, uh, it's going to be challenged to market itself outside side of the normal realm. We've got to go to new markets and we've got to market in new media sources and so they recognized that and rather than ask the government for a handout, they right. simply said let us get a hand up. If we're willing to invest two dollars in our destination, will the state of South Carolina put a dollar in? We know the state benefits from the Grand Strand immensely. Right. Right. Hundreds of millions of dollars of local and state taxes are collected each year along the Grand Strand that never make their way back to here. So it was local businesses who said let us write checks out of our accounts, let us invest in our community. They could invest in their own businesses, but rather they want to invest in promoting their community. The state provides a match, and that's where the two-for-one comes from. And I think what it's going to lead to is in 2008, not only the largest marketing campaign we've had, but hopefully the best one. Uh, new media sources doing a lot of television, newspaper, magazine, as well as internet, but also new markets. And hopefully with the growth potential in, within the United States and as well as international markets, uh, this will help us give life to some growth trends that we certainly need to see in the coming years. Give viewers a sense of how that $15 million compares with, let's say, Virginia Beach 
or Orlando? Because I remember sh you sharing that a lot of these communities have been doing that year after year after year and really uh, been just pounding it. Absolutely. You know, the, the Myrtle Beach area really grew uh, tremendously in the late 90s. If you think back to when Broadway at the Beach opened and we had this right. theater boom and some new hotels opening up, we saw a bit of a growth trend. And, and to a certain extent, I think we kind of took that for granted. Mm -hmm. Other destinations like Virginia Beach and Ocean City, Maryland and Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge right. decided that they wanted to reap some of those benefits too and they started to spend more in promotion. And that accelerated after September 11, 2001 when other destinations started spending more. And we did it first but we began to pull back. So you have other destinations trying to compete for our visitor, outspending us sometimes at a rate of 10 to 1, 12 to 1, 20 oh, to 1. No. And so when you look at the Virginia Beach Convention and Visitor Bureau, they would actually spend uh, 10 times more than we would on a per room basis. And that certainly put us at a disadvantage. Now, the viewer might say, but golly gee, we've got millions of visitors. Uh, how is it that we could be falling behind? Well, the reality is that a lot of those visitors are getting older, and the younger traveler isn't necessarily coming to the Myrtle Beach area as their parents and grandparents did. So it's really important to us to not only market the destination more aggressively and more broadly, but also to attract new visitors that haven't been here before. And we think it's critical for us to succeed in the future if we're going to do that. You talked yesterday, Brad, about having a... 50 to 1, 100 to 1 return on those dollars. Do you think you, you all can really maintain something like that? I mean, you expect that those those dollars will go that far? Well, we certainly think it, it will. In, in some respects, Greg, this past year, for the first time ever, we had a broad television campaign in over 75 markets. Had a great local guy named Dave Carflight that helped put, us to that, put that together for us. And Dave not only showed us how to advertise the destination in new markets, but to do some creative things, like advertising during the Super Bowl. In and of itself, we found a little bit of advertising goes a long way for the Grand Strand. And it's really no surprise. When you think about it, 70% of the visitors who come here come back the next year. So we have the highest repeat visitation of any destination in the eastern United States. So, right? Although we don't know that we'll outsmart the company or outspend the competition, we hope to outsmart them. And if we can't spend more, at least we can spend better and hopefully grow our base. And if we do our job not only in advertising but in service and make sure that the visitors here have a great experience, then I think we've got a better than average chance of bringing them back. And ultimately, that's good for everyone inside and outside the tourism industry. I want to talk about beach renourishment and offshore drilling, obviously. But for fewer who were, weren't with us yesterday, or maybe were, but want to just hear it again and make sure they understood you correctly, the Chamber of Commerce mission here and how it's organized is to do what exactly? And how does it work? Can everyone be a part of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce? Sure. Yeah, the, the mission, as we see it, Greg, is really pretty simple. Uh, we promote business, we protect business, and we serve to improve the entire Grand Strand. So whether it's promoting, protecting, or improving our community, we think ultimately that's what this organization is about in and of itself. The Chamber is just an organization with 54 staff and three offices, but uh, the real strength of the organization lies within the volunteers and those members who are vested in the organization, and that's really where it gets its lift, and that's how we further our mission. And we certainly do so through committees and board of directors, as well as several hundred volunteers. Uh, during the course of the year, we'll put on over 100 events. Some of those are free. Some of those there might be a, an attendance fee. And it stretches from everything, from education and networking, how to be prepared for hurricane season, as well as the very specific issues in human resources or in environmental law. We also uh, spend a good bit of our time and resources in promoting the community, uh, not only to those people who want to visit here, but to those people that want to relocate here. So the mission of the chamber really covers a, a number of tactical areas and broad areas of service and, and programs that we engage ourselves in. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to members of the community, uh, both volunteers and paid members of the chamber, that come here to work together to do things that they couldn't do on their own. You do have indi individual memberships. You talked about yesterday and folks who call the 626-7444 number, ask for memberships. And for viewers who may be watching and want to find out how they can chip in, whether it's through time as a volunteer or through actually just joining to make sure the dollars are available to get the word out and make sure the Myrtle Beach area continues to be highlighted. Absolutely. Uh, we do have a, a number of individual members, and that's open up to anyone in the community, whether or not you're owning and operating in business today. Uh, we've got uh, a number of businesses, over 2,300 businesses that are members of the chamber today. Now here's the interesting thing, Greg. Most people assume that uh, it's only big businesses that are members of the chamber, only large oceanfront hotels. Uh, the interesting thing is that we have more members who are not directly in the tourism business than we do that are. Really? And 
four out of five of our business members have fewer than ten employees. So when we go to our networking events or other chamber events like the one tonight at Family Kingdom, most of the members of the chamber uh, are relatively small businesses. They're fully vested and fully engaged in the Grand Strand. And although they may not have big payrolls and big balance sheets, uh, they're very important to the growth and success and prosperity of our area. So we certainly intend to continue to serve them in the future. Brad, you said four out of five of the members of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce have less than 10 employees. So of the 2,300 plus members, you're saying 16, 1,700 of them have less than 10 employees? Absolutely. And you wouldn't think that normally, wow. but we no. really think that's important. And I credit uh, our board of directors, our, our uh, membership committee, and particularly a small business council that's small business leaders who have served to guide us and tell us how to help small business. Uh, probably the one person that's had the biggest influence on that is Diana Green, our vice president of membership. When she came into that position, we challenged her with coming up with a strategy and tactical plans to go out and better serve small businesses throughout the Grand Strand. And whether your business is east and west of the waterway, whether your customer is a tourist or another business in our community, we want to make sure that we're serving you well and giving your business something that it couldn't get on its own. And we think so far it's working, but there's plenty of small businesses out there that aren't members. And if you're not a member of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber, at least look at one of your local chambers like Conway, North Myrtle Beach, Little River, Loris, or Ainer. They too are very important to the growth of the Grand Strand. And there's some great local chambers throughout the PD and the Grand Strand, and we hope that every business will consider being a member, if not of our chamber, of one of the other chambers. It's a great way to network, to improve your business, and to help the profitability on the bottom line. And a lot of folks support multiple chambers. They'll join two, three, even more uh, chambers. Because of that cooperation, you all are working together to essentially grow Horry County or to grow Horry and Georgetown or Horry, Georgetown and Brunswick counties. There's a common goal there. Absolutely. In our role, we really serve the region. But there really aren't too many things that we'll do that stop along a city or county line. Uh, in the case of a local chamber, a little more focused on that community and its needs. And we certainly welcome that. We consider that a partnership, not a right. competitor situation. Right. So uh, there are a number of businesses that will serve uh, as members of more than one organization and it's our job to make sure that we're not only accountable to them but also that we don't provide so much overlap that it becomes unnecessary and right. we meet regularly with the other chambers oftentimes when we go to Columbia or Washington they'll join us on those visits right. and, uh, each of those organizations has an important mission in their community we not only respect that we appreciate that and we think it's great to be able to work with them and businesses in their community without having to step on toes or overlap with each other yeah Brad offshore drilling what's that all about you know, Greg, this is probably one of the most important issues that's not been well covered in recent months simply because it's going to impact all of us and our long-term future. As you know, the environment is so critical to protect, especially when you talk about tourism. And we're facing a national energy crisis we have for a number of years, and it's not going away on its own. There has been a very concerted effort at the federal level to engage our nation in offshore drilling. And, of course, for many years there had been a moratorium on that. And the challenge is, is how do we engage in offshore drilling to potentially tap resources of not only oil but liquefied natural gas without destroying the ocean front and the coast which is a uh, multi-million dollar industry on any given week along the right. Grand Strand. So in our case we're helping to lead an effort to study the impact of offshore drilling. If there's going to be drilling what is the impact and at what point does it become a burden for our local communities and our tourism interests. Uh, as well we also know that there's some huge economic benefit particularly not for oil Oil, but for natural gas, which is important to industry throughout the Carolinas. So mm -hmm. we haven't necessarily said it's good or bad. We said if it's done well and it doesn't impact the direct coast, then there may be some potential. But we think it needs to be studied. Cool. At the end of the day, the federal government is more than likely going to lift the moratorium. Mm -hmm. The question is where will you be able to drill? Who will control that and what proceeds will emanate to the state? Mm -hmm. If we can have some influence on that, then we think we have an opportunity to serve the community and our tourism industry. And nothing more important than protecting that coastline because without the coast, tourism goes away real quick. Absolutely. That ties in well with beach renourishment, and that's been a big, a big topic and a lot happening with that right now. How is that uh, going? And what's the uh, Chamber's view on be beach renourishment? Well, we think protecting our beaches is absolutely critical. As much as we talk a lot about building Interstate 73 or funding tourism promotion, creating more air service or expanding an airport, we think that the most critical resource we have to protect is that beach because uh, 60 miles of sand along the Grand Strand uh, literally is gold in the eyes of South Carolina and its nation as it generates what is really needed to sustain a $4 billion tourism industry. Beach renourishment is unfortunately a necessary evil. Over time, uh, the sand washes away, our beaches become 
uh, less plentiful, less narrow, and so it's important to protect our beach line and to protect our tourism industry. It's tough though, Greg, because when you go to the United States Congress, for every legislator that's on the coast and understands that, there are three or four that just don't get it. Now, if we were talking about soybean subsidies in Nebraska, <laughs> believe me, we'd have no problem getting federal monies, but when it comes to the coastline, it's a bit of a challenge, and this past year, there were zero dollars in the federal budget, not one dollar allocated, so it took a lot of work mm -hmm. by people like Lindsey Graham and Henry Brown, as well as the support of Congressman Spratt and Congressman Clyburn to solidify funds for our area. In fact, we hit a huge home run. And credit uh, the mayors in our area, Mayor John Rhodes, uh, Marilyn Hatley, Roy Hyman, as well as Mayor Armstrong from Atlantic Beach, and our county council chairwoman, Liz Gillen, who worked together with the congressional delegation to get nearly $40 million for renourishment. Is that That's right? a huge amount that we have not seen in any recent year, but it won't be sustaining dollars that will recur on a regular basis. So each year we're going to have to go back to the state and federal government and lobby for a little bit more. Now, that's a lot of money, and some people question buying sand with that much money, but in our case, that sand sustains tourism, and tourism sustains the state. So it's an important battle. Like offshore drilling, we want to make sure we're ahead of the issue because if we don't protect ourselves and our coastline, we can't protect tourism, and that's not only bad for the Grand Strand and PD, that's bad for our entire state. That is tremendous, Brad, $40 million, and of course, those the, when we see the machines out or see the big pieces pulling sand out and shipping it back uh, inland. That, how, how does that work exactly? Uh, would the $40 million would be allocated principally to bring more sand up to the beaches? Yeah, the Army Corps of Engineers will go out and find uh, resources of they can draw from the sand. They'll actually pipe it in and uh, it's not the most prettiest of the processes, but it certainly is, uh, is relatively efficient in the way they've done it. Uh, we've been very fortunate this time that they're able to start on the south end and work northward and mm -hmm. we think it's going to have a huge impact. And of course part of those money as well, Greg, will go to uh, pipes that will take stormwater off the beach. One of the challenges we face is that in any given day when it's hot and dry in the summer and we get a little bit of a rain, uh, it'll wash bacteria into some of the swashes and uh, when nobody likes to see those beach closure signs. Usually we're only closing 50 or 75 feet right, right. where we have a high level of bacteria. Our goal is to eventually have enough pipes that we'll be able to run all that bacteria out into the middle of the ocean. Tremendous. Nothing dangerous or toxic, right. but it's certainly not something you want young children swimming in. And sure. so this infrastructure improvement will allow us to do that. That's important not only to those of us who want to enjoy ourselves and, uh, on the beach with our families, but we also want to make sure that we protect our beach readings and we don't give the impression that our beaches aren't clean. We have some of the cleanest beaches in all the eastern United States, but because we voluntarily test more often than most, we need to take the precautions of moving that stormwater out where it won't impact any human being. So there are communities that do not test uh, as on a regular basis as the Myrtle Beach area. Yeah, and this area, in fact, the entire state of South Carolina tests far more regularly on its coastline than most other states. It's a good thing because it keeps all of us very aware of the situation and if there were to be a problem we would know it uh, far sooner than most. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's like anything when you when you measure more often than uh, you stand the test of, of reporting and sometimes the media outside of our area uh, might not understand that so we have to work with them to, to better indicate exactly what is going on on the coastline. The bottom line is among 60 miles of the Grand Strand there's probably always going to be a, a 50 foot stretch of beach that might have some high bacteria <laughs> levels. The important thing is we're honest about it, we're up front, we're measuring it regularly and now the challenge is what do we do to solve those problems right. and make sure that the water along the coastline is as clean as it can be. Absolutely. Brad, we've got about five minutes and there's so many other big topics. Of course, you talked about transportation a good bit yesterday. I-73 is going to happen. The Chamber's goal is that it will happen within uh, the next decade. Absolutely. We need I-73. It can bring new jobs and, and new industry. It will also help the tourism industry grow as we're able to get tourists here more quickly and for those of us who uh, live here, it's important to think that you know during the height of the summer season, with all our visitors and residents, we're just about as big as Charlotte. So imagine having a major hurricane like Katrina mm. take a turn for the worse and maybe pick up speed that we're not prepared for. Uh, we need more roads and access out of the area in the event of a hurricane. So for those of us along the Grand Strand, it's uh, it's about the economy and safety. But when you think about some of your viewers in the PD, places like Marion County, where they desperately need an economic lifeline, I-73 will connect this area to I-95 and enable us to attract new industry into our region. That new industry could bring higher paying jobs and that's important to the areas throughout South Carolina that desperately need new industry in their region. So hopefully we can see I-73 built within the next 10 years. If we do, Greg, we think it will pay for itself, not only in terms of the job growth, but the growth in tourism along the coast. You know, we were with Larry Biddle last week on Thursday and Friday at the uh, Coastal Carolina Association of Realtors. We were highlighting, talking about education, 
and he had a great quote of Darla Moore's that, uh, as it relates to economic development and education, saying there is no relationship between education and economic development. She said education is economic development. Education is economic development. And that really ties in to the aspect that the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce is working hard to educate as well. I know you all have really pushed the Chamber Academy, something we got excited about and that stepped out. You all are doing many other vehicles there to, to get the word out and to educate your well, members. I think it's an important part of any Chamber of Commerce to serve its members in the education and training realm. But we also think we've got to be proactive in serving our institutions of education in our community. In the case of Horry County School Schools. Recent funding decisions at the state level have, have made it more difficult for us to maintain the standard or achieve the standards that we want in public education, as well as when you look at how our local college, Ori Georgetown Technical College, and our University of Coastal Carolina are funded, it's embarrassing to think how much they get on a per student basis in comparison to other institutions throughout the state. So right. we think part of our role is to be able to say what they may not be able to, and that is that we need more money coming back to our schools, our colleges, our universities along the Grand strand. But even beyond that, Greg, we think it's important to be proactive in some of the measures that uh, our General Assembly might take that may not always be in the best interest of education. Mm -hmm. Things like map testing, which gives parents in the school district an opportunity to see how their child does throughout the school year, not just at the end of the school year or beyond. So right. measures like that where the business community can speak up and say, as Darla Moore has said, that education is economic development. One cannot happen without the other. We need to excel in education both at the lower levels as well as the higher institutions of learning and we think it's the responsibility of the business community to not only speak up about education but stand up for our schools and we certainly intend to do that and we'll continue to as long as it makes sense. The event tonight or really later today 415 to 7, 730 out there at Family Kingdom. If viewers uh, are, are members or maybe even not members but uh, this is a good incentive to join to get out to Family Kingdom on a Thursday but if they're already members they can just call to sign up if they haven't yet registered for tonight's event. Absolutely. The business after Hours. Call us at 626-7444 and let us know you'd like to come out to the business after hours. It will probably be one of the best attended ever. There's no oh, better yeah. way to end the summer season than uh, spend an evening with your family at uh, uh, one of the world's few oceanfront amusement parks, Family Kingdom Amusement Park, which had a great summer. Right. And uh, we'll be celebrating there tonight. And if you're a member, give us a call. If you're not a member and want to become one, it's a great opportunity to join us. And we look forward to having a great event. Yes, TripAdvisor ra ranked them number five in, in America. I was amazed. Outside of or outside of Disney. Oh, we were thrilled. I know the uh, the owners were, were very thrilled as well. But you know, Greg, for for about a year now, everybody had heard all the doom and gloom. The pavilion's closing. There's nothing to do in Myrtle Beach. It's just becoming nothing but condos and uh, timeshares. And the reality is, there's still more for anybody to do than you could accomplish in one vacation. And I think Family Kingdom is a great example of that. It's a mainstay. It's been a tradition for for thousands oh, of visitors yeah, for many years. Yeah. And, and certainly now, uh, it's it's got a unique role along the ocean front. Yes. So we're going to celebrate it in style as we end what we think has been a good summer season for 2007 and look to what we hope to be an even better season in 2008. Absolutely, Brad. October 25th is getting close as well. A big event, the uh, annual, is it the 67th annual? Uh, that's absolutely right. We'll have our annual meeting. And, of course, Rhonda Rich, who is a phenomenal speaker, great writer as yeah, well. Yeah, we love Rhonda. Some of your viewers might know her from the articles in the Myrtle Beach Herald. Right. Uh, but we're excited to hear her speak, and I hear she is just dynamic. So she'll be given a keynote address, but there'll be a number of other speakers. Great opportunity for people in the community to learn about economic development from right. Hugh Owens, uh, who chairs right. Myrtle Beach yes. Regional EDC. We'll also have Dr. Donald Shunk, who is the research economist for Coastal Carolina University. Yes. Phenomenally talented economist. Who writes for the Herald people. once a month. Yeah. He's a great resource, as well as some other programs that will be educational-oriented for our members. And then, of course, the luncheon, which is always looked forward to because we will unveil there a number of business awards, right. like the Small Business of the Year, as well as two very important awards that will be uh, uh, announced that day, the Citizen of the Year and the Ashby Ward Pioneer Award. So right. it's a neat day. We start out with an entertaining address by Rhonda Rich, some great educational, resourceful speeches in between, and then a luncheon with some awards. If you're looking for a great way to spend half a day, let us know. We'd love to have you at the Chamber's yeah. annual meeting. Brad, you talked about some of the, as, as I was thinking about a book of Brad Dean Quips, you, you talked about some great inspirations. Ashby Ward's obviously been a, one of them. Who are the other big inspirations in your life? Well, I think certainly I draw upon family and, and coaches and teachers throughout my younger years. Um, but in recent years, um, people like 
uh, you know, my wife, uh, Miriam, who is uh, far smarter than I'll ever be. And uh, any time I ever have a question or need a perspective outside of the chamber, outside of the business community, she certainly has that. I've been very fortunate to work with a number of our local leaders and state leaders. And you know, when I think of people like John Rose and Liz Gillen and people in our legislative delegation, uh, Billy Witherspoon has become a great friend. And, and these are people that you can trust, not only to give you feedback about your job and organization, uh, but unique perspectives on the community and its history. And then I'm excited about some of the people who have come into the community in recent years, Greg. Uh, we've got a wonderful new individual leading Coastal Carolina University, Dr. David Desenzo, who I think is a great resource. And people like Dr. Desenzo, as well as uh, Neil Wilson, who's run away Georgetown Technical right. College for a number of years now. Those have been great resources for me to determine not just what happens in the community, but how can the chamber impact those areas. So I'm fortunate to have a lot of great advisors around me. I've had a number of great chairs at the board level. Of course, you'll be hearing from Bernie Dove tomorrow. And yes, Bernie's yes. been a good friend and a uh, great inspiration for me for many years. So far too many to name uh, in one sitting, but uh, between family, friends, and chamber contacts, I'm fortunate to have a lot of people who aren't just supportive of the chamber, they're supportive of the Grand Strand. And that's certainly, uh, those are the kinds of people you want to have around you. Those are great words. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Brad. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. Stay tuned to more Carolina People with Brad Dean coming up next. So glad that Brad opened up with one of my reporters back in May of 2004 with those great words. His goal was to remain out of the spotlight. That quiet, quiet giant just creeping up behind. He's remained out of the spotlight, but whenever he gets in front of the spotlight, it's to announce a spectacular new opening of $10 million that have been raised in the state, chipping another $5 million, showing up in front of the convention center, highlighting a Republican presidential debate coming and talking about other national debates and other activities happening right here right here in our town, right here in, in Myrtle Beach, big opportunities. There's also small things like the warm welcome earlier this week, the business after hours tonight, 4.15 to 7, members and one guest. You'd like to get on that list. You can call in if you're not registered, 626-7444, 626-7444. There's also the big annual membership meeting coming up on October 25th. Lots of things you can do as a member of the chamber. Whether you're an individual, whether you're an employee of a small company, you heard him talk about four out of five members of the chamber are businesses with less than ten employees. That could be you. You can be a part of the Myrtle Beach Area Chamber of Commerce. Make a difference. Go online to MyrtleBeachAreaChamber.com or pick up the phone 626-7444. Make a difference.